at a train station, a train number 2781, was arriving on track A. As soon as it arrived, a woman and her young daughter got into that train. An FBI agent called Peter saw them and offered his seat to them. Suddenly, he noticed a suspicious man putting his backpack under the passenger seat. After that, that man got out of the train right away. Peter checked the backpack immediately. He was surprised when he found out that the backpack contained a bomb that was going to explode soon. He calmly told the passengers to get out of the train now. But a passenger announced that there was a bomb inside of that train. All passengers in that train panicked and rushed to the exit right away. When Peter was about to get out of that train, he saw the woman and her young daughter whom he saw earlier. He tried to help them to get out of the train, but suddenly that bomb exploded. Fortunately, that woman and her young daughter managed to be saved. After that, the police came to that place. A police officer told Peter that there was only a passenger who died from that incident. While Peter was receiving first aid, he noticed that the man responsible for the bombing was standing among the crowd. He rose from his seat and chased that man immediately. While he was looking for that man at the dark alley, that man suddenly attacked him. Peter was struggling to fight him back because he was still injured. He saw the rattlesnake tattoo on that man's back. Then, that man ran away from that place. Peter chased him again but unfortunately he got hit by a car. At a cybersecurity company, a woman was getting prepared for an interview session with a television station. That woman was called Rose Larkin. She was a director in that cybersecurity company. Suddenly, a woman came to that room. She excitedly told her that their company had received additional funds. One year later, Peter was working the night shift at the basement of the White House. That evening, when Peter arrived at his office, he was called by his boss to her room. His boss was the White House Chief of Staff. She was called Diane Farr. Diane wanted to show Peter the video of his interview with a journalist who believed in conspiracy theory called Elliot Rome. In that video, Elliot accused Peter of being the perpetrator of the bombing. He also accused Peter's father of being involved in this incident before he died in a car accident. Diane was unhappy about that interview. She said that she was going to make sure that the president of the USA knew that Peter was the hero in that incident and not the villain. But she asked Peter to reject any ambush interview in the future so no random journalist could twist what he had said ever again. She also told Peter to focus on his work as a night agent in the secret service called the Night Action. After that, Peter went to his room. He met a man called Hawkins. He was the deputy director of the FBI. He didn't like Peter because he spent more time doing his job as a night agent in the secret service that was given by the White House chief of staff instead of doing his job as an FBI agent. Every night in that office, all Peter was doing was only sitting in a dark and small room and answering incoming telephone calls. At another place, Rose greeted her Aunt Emma Campbell and Uncle Henry Campbell who had just returned home. She was happy to see them because they were the only family members that she had now. Rose told them that she had been fired by the board of directors at the cybersecurity company where she was working. She explained that she was fired because she filed for bankruptcy after she lost everything due to a data breach that happened in that company. The investors blamed her and wanted her to leave the company. Later that night, two men arrived in that place. Apparently, they were assassins who were hired to kill Rose's aunt and uncle. Rose suddenly woke up because she heard her uncle and aunt talking downstairs. They were talking about warning Osprey, burning some important documents, the country being trouble, and a driver in the woods. They were worried because Osprey was being targeted and there was no one in the White House whom they could trust. Rose was surprised when she heard that. She didn't understand about what her uncle and aunt meant. She approached them to ask them about their conversation. Her aunt was surprised when she saw her there. She aimed her gun at her. Rose's aunt and uncle said that there was no time for them to explain everything to her. They told her to run away from that place through the back door and go to Finer's house immediately. They gave her a piece of paper that contained a telephone number and some words. They told her to call that number and say the words written on the paper after saying the password night action. Rose didn't understand about what was happening, but she did what her aunt and uncle told her. Not long after that, those two assassins broke into their house. They attacked the Campbells right away. They managed to kill Henry by strangling him and kill Emma by shooting her with a gun for several times. Upon running away, Rose saw one of the assassins in the house and that man started to chase after her. Rose ran as fast as she could and finally got to Finer's house. She called the telephone number on the paper immediately. At the White House, Peter heard the telephone ringing. He answered the call right away. Rose said the password to him. 
Peter asked if she was Sidewinder or Gazelle. Rose was confused when she heard that question. She told him that her uncle was called Henry and her aunt was called Emma. She pleaded with him and said that her aunt and uncle were in danger. Peter realized that it was an urgent and dangerous situation. So, he called for help and sent a police patrol to the house. Rose was getting more frightened when she found out that the assassin whom she saw earlier followed her to that house. Peter helped her to hide. He told Rose to lock the bathroom door from the inside, go to a room, and hide in a cupboard in that room. He said that Rose needed to do this to trick the assassin that she was hiding in the bathroom. He also told Rose to put a mirror on the floor so she could watch the assassin from afar. That assassin was called Dale. Dale finally broke into the house and went upstairs. He saw the bathroom door that was locked from the inside. He opened that door and found nobody in that bathroom. After that, he walked to the room when Rose was hiding. Rose was crying when she saw Dale getting closer to her. Peter tried to calm her down by saying that the police patrol was on their way. He asked Rose to attack Dale back if Dale finally found and attack her and the police patrol hadn't arrived in that place. Suddenly, a man came to that room. Rose was relieved when she found out that it was a police officer and not the assassin. The police patrol managed to arrive in time to save her. At the White House, Peter reported to Diane about what happened to the Campbells. Diane was surprised when she heard that. She told Peter that they couldn't leave their witness at the hands of the local police. She also told him not to let Hawkins take Rose away because Rose was the key witness of this crime. While Hawkins was trying to take Rose away, Peter came to that place and stopped him. Hawkins asked him what he was doing there. Peter told him that he was ordered by Diane to take Rose with him. Hawkins was getting even mad at Peter because he chose to obey Diane than him. After that, Peter brought Rose to his apartment. Rose was confused about everything that happened that night. As she remembered, her aunt and uncle were just ordinary people who were working at an acquiring company. Peter said that he couldn't tell Rose about the real identities of her aunt and uncle because he also didn't know about it. He didn't even know that the Campbells were the agents who worked at the White House until Rose called him that night. Even if he knew about it, his boss would have told him not to tell anything to anyone. Rose and Peter finally arrived at Peter's apartment. Peter asked Rose to give her phone to him so nobody could trace her location. Then, he opened his safe, put Rose's phone there, and took a weapon from that safe. He also set a surveillance camera in his apartment to anticipate if there was any intruder who broke into that place. Meanwhile Rose went to the next room and packed some clothes from the cupboard there. In that room, she saw a bundle of clippings about renegade FBI agent who died before trial, a counterintelligence officer who denied claim of treason, and a disgraced intelligence officer who died in a car accident. Rose asked Peter about those articles. Peter finally admitted that he was an FBI agent who worked at the White House. Then, he told her that they needed to go somewhere to hide soon. Rose and Peter then left that apartment. While they were heading to the car, two men suddenly came to that place and attacked Peter. Peter managed to attack them back and defeat them. Turned out, those men had been listening to what Elliot Rome had been saying. They believed that Peter was the man responsible for the bombing. Peter asked them to give their wallets to him. Rose thought that Peter was going to steal their money. But turned out, Peter just wanted to take their identity cards and give them to Diane. After that, Rose and Peter got into the car. On their way to their hiding place, Peter told Rose that his father had been accused of being traitor. Unfortunately, his father had died before he managed to clear his name. Suddenly, Peter noticed that there was a car following them. Turned out, the driver of that car was the assassin who had killed Rose's aunt and uncle. He was still chasing Rose and trying to kill her. Peter called the White House immediately to ask for help. Dale kept chasing them and trying to hit their car like a crazy person. Peter and Dale began to shoot each other. With his driving skills, Peter finally managed to change their direction and escape from Dale. Then, they went to a rented house that was located in a remote area. Peter rented that house under his friend's name. After they got into that house and made sure that they were already safe, Rose asked Peter about the female clothes in his apartment. Peter said that those clothes belonged to his ex-fiancée who had left him and returned to Texas. Then, Rose asked him about the night action. Peter told her that the night action was a counterintelligence program. He was responsible for answering the incoming calls from the agents who were in danger. Rose was surprised when she heard that. She asked if her aunt and uncle were spies who were working for the government. Peter said that he didn't know anything since he was only a low-level employee at the White House. Then, Peter watched his apartment through the surveillance camera that he had set there before. 
He called Diane immediately after he saw two intruders broke into his apartment. Diane ordered the agents who had been guarding outside Peter's apartment to get into that apartment. But unfortunately, when they arrived there, the two intruders were already gone. After that, Peter replayed the recorded video of the intruders who broke into his apartment. He noticed that one of the intruders wore a ring. He took a picture of that ring so he could investigate it later. The next morning, Peter brought Rose to Diane. Diane was glad because they were safe. She invited them to go inside of the house. Turned out, Hawkins was also in that house. He told Peter to leave that room because this case was not for Peter. While Peter was leaving that room, he met Rose who had just returned from the restroom. He asked her to tell everything to Diane and Hawkins. But Rose said that she couldn't tell them everything because she remembered that her aunt said that there was no one whom she could trust at the White House. At another place, Dale and his partner, Ellen, came to a woman's house. They pretended to be a married couple who wanted to look around that house. They also carried a baby with them. That woman agreed to let them in. When they got into that house, Dale and Ellen killed that woman right away and took a bag from that place. After that, Dale sent a message to the person who hired him to kill that woman. He and Ellen left the baby behind and drove off. Three years ago, Rose was having an interview with a journalist. She told the journalist that she was optimistic that her company would have 200 employees by the third quarter of next year. Suddenly, a woman came and interrupted that interview. She told Rose that her biggest client, Lawrence Finster, called her. Rose excused herself and received that call. Lawrence was angry because the company's system had been hacked. He asked Rose to give 7, 2 million bitcoins to him as the compensation. Rose rushed to the control room to check the problem. She was surprised when she found out that the hacker was his friend, Adam. In the present time, Rose was being interrogated by Hawkins and Diane. Hawkins urged her to tell him about the descriptions of the hacker. Rose lied to him by saying that she forgot about how that person looked like. She refused to tell him about the truth because she couldn't trust him yet. Then, Diane told Rose that some agents from the Secret Service would take her to the Remborn Hotel. After Rose and Peter left that room, Hawkins told Diane that they shouldn't trust Peter to protect Rose because he thought that Peter was an amateur. But Diane said that she believed in Peter. Rose and Peter finally arrived at the Remborn Hotel. Rose didn't like that place because there was no internet, gadgets, or books there. She felt like she was living in the prison. Peter assured her that she was safe there because she was protected by the Secret Service. Then, he left that place because he needed to go to the White House to work. Meanwhile, Ellen was driving her car at a high speed. Because of that, she was stopped by the police officer. Ellen stopped her car and took her gun. But Dale told her to put down her weapon and take the speeding ticket that would be given by the police officer. At the White House, Diane had a meeting with Hawkins and Ben Almora. Ben Almora was the director of the United States Secret Service. Hawkins told them that the Campbells were working for him in the counterintelligence but they had retired a few years ago. During their time in the FBI, they were assigned to hired foreign spies. Hawkins refused to give further details about their job because the FBI would take care of this case. After Hawkins left that room, Diane ordered Peter to find the documents that were investigated by Henry and Emma when they worked for the FBI. She also told Peter to double-check Hawkins's work because she was worried if Hawkins was hiding something from them. After that, Peter met his colleague to find an update about the ring that was worn by the intruder who broke into his apartment. His colleague told him that the ring was similar to the sigil from the Royal House of Yugoslavia. Peter told him to investigate that ring further. Then, Peter went to his office and checked the documents that were investigated by Henry and Emma. He found out that Hawkins used to be the mentor of that couple when they worked for the FBI. He called Diane immediately and told her about it. Diane was surprised when she heard that. She wondered what else Hawkins had been hiding from her. Not long after that, Peter received a call on the night action number. He was surprised when he found out that it was Rose who called him. Turned out, Rose called him because she just wanted to talk to him. She was feeling lonely at the hotel. At another place, Ellen was still curious about what was inside of the bag that they had taken from their recent victim. She finally decided to check that bag and found a doll that was equipped with a hidden camera. Dale took that doll from her. He would give that doll to the person who hired them. Suddenly, he received a call from that man. That man ordered Dale to finish his job to kill Rose at a hotel. Then, he talked to his colleague in that room. He said that Dale had been working for him for the past eight years and he always had excellent results. Meanwhile Rose was still talking to Peter on the phone. 
She told him that she lost her job after she was betrayed by her friend. Then, she asked him to have breakfast with her the next morning. Peter agreed to do that. The next morning, Diane woke Peter up from his sleep. Peter apologized to her because he slept on a sofa in her office. Then, he gave the documents that Diane asked her. After that, Peter went to the Remborn Hotel. He was surprised when he realized that the Secret Service agents who were assigned to guard Rose at that hotel were gone. He also found out that the power went out. He was afraid if something bad happened to Rose. He rushed to Rose's room and saw Rose was still there. She had just taken a shower and was only in a robe. Peter urged her to leave that place immediately. Apparently, Ellen had arrived at that place. She pretended to be a janitor and knocked the door of Rose's room. She had prepared her suppressed firearm to kill Rose. She finally got into that room but she didn't find anyone there. While Rose and Peter were going downstairs, Dale saw them and shot them right away. Peter shot him back and tried to run away from him with Rose. Dale chased them immediately. Peter and Rose went to a room but unluckily there was no exit there. They finally decided to break the glass window to escape from that place. But when Peter tried to help Rose to get out of that room, he suddenly fell because the glass he was standing on was not strong enough to hold him. Fortunately, he was all right. He then told Rose to jump through the window. After that, they fled into the streets and went to a clothes store to buy new clothes for Rose. When they visited that clothes store, Rose stole a phone that belonged to a visitor there and gave it to Peter. Peter used that phone to call Diane. He asked her why they pulled out the Secret Service agents who were guarding Rose at the Remborn Hotel. Diane was surprised when she heard that. She asked everyone to leave that room except Ben Almora and Nathan Briggs from the Secret Service. Then, she turned on the speaker on her phone and asked Peter to repeat what she said. Ben was surprised when he heard that. After Nathan checked about what happened, they found out that the command to pull out the Secret Service agents was issued 30 minutes ago. The only people who could give that command were the President, Diane, Ben, Nathan, and Hawkins. Because of that, Ben called Hawkins' office right away. But his office told him that Hawkins was unavailable and they didn't know where he was. After Diane heard that, she asked Peter and Rose for their location so she could send someone to take them to the White House. Peter refused her offer right away. He didn't think that Rose could be safe at the White House since they couldn't trust anyone there. Then, Peter and Rose agreed to investigate this problem by themselves. They needed to figure out what the Campbells were investigating and why they were killed. They began their investigation by visiting the crime scene, which was the house of the Campbells. Rose told Peter that at the night when the incident took place, she overheard the conversation of her aunt and uncle. That time, her aunt and uncle were talking about Osprey, some important documents, and an engineer. They were also talking about a government officer at the White House who happened to be a traitor. Rose also remembered that her uncle mentioned about a driver in the woods, but she didn't understand what he meant. Peter assumed that the driver that Rose's uncle meant was a hard drive. Rose suddenly remembered about a cabin in the woods. They decided to go to that cabin immediately because they might find the answer that they were looking for in that place. At another place, Hawkins met the man who hired Dale and Ellen to kill Rose and her family. Rose and Peter finally arrived at the cabin and started to look for the hard drive in that place. At the motel, Dale received a call from his boss. His boss told him that there was a change of the plan. He gave him a new order. At the cabin, Peter finally found the hard drive inside the wall. As an engineer, Rose tried to use her skills to open it but she failed. That hard drive had been heavily encrypted so she couldn't access the files in it. Peter was surprised when he saw the name of the folder was 2781. It was the number of the train that he was on when the bombing incident happened. He wondered why the Campbells were investigating that bombing incident. Then, he called the night action number to talk to Diane. He purposely called that number so the White House couldn't trace their location. Diane told him that they had found out that it was Hawkins who gave the order to pull out the Secret Service agents who were guarding Rose. They managed to find out about it after they searched a computer in his office. Unfortunately, they couldn't ask any questions to Hawkins since he was already dead. He was murdered by someone and his dead body was discovered by a farmer in Maryland later. Peter was surprised when he heard that. He couldn't believe that they had the courage to murder the deputy director of the FBI. Diane was also afraid if something bad happened to them. So, she asked Peter to take Rose and the hard drive that they found in the cabin to the White House. One year ago, a few days after the bombing incident took place, Diane met Peter for the first time at the zoo. She offered him to work as a night agent in the secret service called the Night Action. 
She said that it was a secret investigation program that was run by the FBI to improve the national security. She told Peter that he would be working at the basement of the White House and his job would be answering the incoming calls from the agents who were in trouble. She offered that job to Peter because she needed a loyal, honest, and dutiful person like Peter who knew how to take the right action when he faced an emergency. She likened that job to the zoo that had many dangerous and wild animals but they could still control those animals because of the help of the zookeeper. In the present time, Peter told Diane that he and Rose would be at the White House in an hour. After he ended his call, Rose protested his decision to come to the White House because she still couldn't trust anyone there. Peter said that he was only a low-level employee who didn't have any power to solve this problem. By going to the White House, they could decrypt the hard drive because they would have the resources that they needed there. Peter believed that Diane was the only government officer at the White House whom they could trust to help them. He was betting their lives on the fact that Diane would be on their side. Then, Peter called Diane again. He told her that Rose refused to come with him and asked her to wait until 10 a.m. in the next morning. Diane agreed to give them time. After that, Peter and Rose decided to sleep in the woods because they had a plan. At the White House, the President of the United States had a special meeting with several government officers. They were talking about the murder investigations of Hawkins and the Campbells. Surprisingly, there was also a man who hired Dale and Ellen to kill Rose and the Campbells in that room. After the meeting, Diane told the President that she had no idea why Hawkins pulled out the Secret Service agents who were guarding Rose. She said that she was still trying to find out about what the Campbells were investigating before they died to find the answer. The President finally decided to tell her about the truth. Meanwhile in the woods, Peter and Rose were still watching the cabin from afar. They wanted to know if the assassins who were chasing after Rose was going to come to that cabin or not. Not long after that, Ellen and Dale came to that cabin. This time, Ellen pretended to be an injured traveler who wanted to seek help, meanwhile Dale threw a grenade into the cabin. Peter and Rose were shocked when they saw that. They ran away from that place immediately. Ellen heard a noise from the woods. She aimed her sniper rifle at the woods right away. Ellen and Dale searched the woods but Peter and Rose managed to hide from them. Peter also managed to write down the license plate number of Ellen and Dale's car. After Ellen and Dale left that place, Rose told Peter that they couldn't trust Diane because those two assassins managed to find that cabin. It meant that Diane was the one who informed it to them since she was the only person who knew their location. But Peter refused to believe it. He still believed that Diane could be trusted. At the White House, Ben Almora called a Secret Service agent called Chelsea Arrington. He told her that he would order Eric Monks to help her to protect the daughter of the Vice President of the United States called Maddie. Eric was entrusted with protecting Maddie because he managed to protect and save the former President of the United States from the attempted murder before. He even got shot in the shoulder when he was doing his job. Arrington reminded Maddie to bring her panic button to anticipate if something bad happened to her. Meanwhile Peter was calling his friend to ask for help to investigate the license plate number of Ellen and Dale's car. His friend was called Cisco. He was a police officer. After that, he and Rose talked about the conversation of the Campbells at the night when they got murdered. That night, the Campbells said that the country was in danger and something would be going down in seven days. If what they said was true, then there were only five days left for Rose and Peter to investigate this case. Rose said that she needed a supercomputer that was usually used by the CIA or NSA to decrypt the hard drive. So, she planned to use Diane to decrypt the hard drive. She and Peter were going to give the hard drive to Diane, steal her access card, and get into the system when the FBI worked on the hard drive. If that plan failed, Peter asked Rose to meet him at the park called Foundry Branch. It was the place where Peter and his father used to go fishing together. After that, Peter met Diane in her office and gave the hard drive to her. He lied that Rose ran away from him while he was taking a shower at the gas station. The FBI engineer said that it would take around five hours for him to decrypt that hard drive. Diane warned everyone not to come to that room once they had finished decrypting that hard drive. Nobody was allowed to enter that room except her and the president. Then, Peter had to leave because he needed to execute his plan with Rose. Before he left Diane's office, he saw Diane's access card on the table. At the university, Maddie's professor began to subtly flirt with her. Maddie was happy when her professor complimented her painting. At another place, Ellen was sick of staying at a motel. Because of that, Dale asked her to stay at an open house. Ellen was happy when she saw that fancy house. She had been dreaming of living a normal life but Dale didn't feel the same. 
Dale chose the house because he knew that the owner of that house was going to stay in Florida for months. It was easy for him and Ellen to break into that house. At a restaurant, Rose opened her laptop there and waited for Peter's instruction from the White House. Meanwhile Maddie was visiting a bar with Eric and Arrington who were watching her from a distance. Because she felt bored, she began to approach a man and talk to him. Maddie thought that the man was going to flirt with her. But turned out, that man insulted and harassed her because he knew that Maddie was the daughter of the Vice President of the United States. Then, he suddenly grabbed Maddie's hair. Eric and Arrington were surprised when they saw that. They attacked that man and saved Maddie from him immediately. After they brought Maddie to the car, Arrington scolded Eric because he didn't do a good job in preventing that man from assaulting Maddie. Eric said that it was because of his shoulder injury. Arrington got frustrated with him. She said that she was going to report it. Two minutes before the FBI finished decrypting the hard drive, Peter received a call from Rose. He then knocked on the door of Diane's office and told Diane that Rose wanted to talk to her. Apparently, it was a part of Rose and Peter's plan. Rose was trying to distract Diane while Peter was stealing Diane's access card. Peter was going to use that card to enter the server room where the hard drive was being decrypted. In the server room, Peter connected a USB Wi-Fi adapter to the computer so he could transfer the files in that hard drive to Rose's laptop. Rose managed to receive those files in her laptop. But suddenly, two police officers came to that restaurant. Rose panicked when she saw them. She ended her call with Diane immediately. After that, Diane was heading back to the server room. But when she was about to enter that room, she couldn't find her access card anywhere. She came to her office to look for it. Fortunately, Peter managed to return Diane's access card under the paper on the table before she suspected him. Then, Diane entered the server room. But she was confused and surprised when she didn't find any files in the hard drive. At the restaurant, Rose packed her things quickly and tried to leave that restaurant. But suddenly, a police officer called her because she left her power adapter there. At the server room, Diane finally found out that someone had entered that room and connected a USB Wi-Fi adapter to that computer. She realized that Peter was the one who did it. She came to meet Peter and asked him why he did this. She also asked him if he had killed Hawkins. Peter finally admitted that he entered the server room and transferred those files to Rose. But he accused her back of sending the assassins to the cabin because she was the only person who knew about their location. Before Diane explained everything to Peter, she gave her phone to her subordinate and asked him to check that phone since it might have been hacked. Then, she told Peter that the president ordered the night action to investigate the Metro bombing because the intelligence couldn't find any clues, motives, or the perpetrator of that incident. The president didn't believe in the report and the leaked statement from a terrorist group, People's Independence Front or PIF. The Campbells who were investigating this case were close to find the government officer from the White House who was responsible for the Metro bombing. But sadly, they got murdered before they found the answer. Diane suspected that that person was Hawkins, but she had to find the evidence first. She believed that the person who did this was a high-ranking officer because he managed to pull out the Secret Service agents who were guarding Rose and set a surveillance camera in her phone. So, Peter and Diane needed to work together to investigate this problem. Diane assured Peter that he could trust her. At another place, Arrington called Ben and told him that Eric had failed to protect Maddie. Ben asked her to give Eric a chance because he had been through a lot. He said that Ben was the best Secret Service agent before he got shot in the shoulder when he protected the former president. He used to be Eric's partner so he knew that they could trust Eric. The next day, Rose stayed at a motel to hide. She began to check the files of the hard drive that she had received last night. She sent her address to Peter and told him to come soon. When she checked the files of the hard drive, she found a video of an interview with Omar Zadar, the leader of PIF. In that interview, Omar admitted that his party took credit for the Metro bombing. Rose still had no idea about what was going to happen in five days. At another place, Arrington met her ex-boyfriend who was working in the CIA at the park. She asked him to investigate on how a national hero like Eric could end up in her small team. At the university, Maddie showed her drawing to her professor. It was a monster drawing but Maddie said that it was her father. Her professor complimented her drawing and continued to flirt with her. Suddenly, Arrington came to that room and told Maddie that her father was going to visit her tomorrow. Maddie seemed upset when she heard that. At the motel, Rose was still checking the files of the hard drive. She found a blurry writing that stated, Silo Engineering, 4220, Lincoln Road there. She thought that it might be a clue. Suddenly, Peter came to that place with Diane. 
Rose was mad at Peter because he brought Diane with him. At another place, Maddie's professor sent a text to someone. He said that he was getting closer to Maddie. Turned out, he purposely approached the daughter of the vice president because he had a secret plan. The person who received his message was the man with the rattlesnake tattoo who had a fight with Peter after the bombing incident took place. Two years ago, Eric was working as a secret service agent who was assigned to protect the president of the United States. When the president was visiting a factory, Eric noticed that there was a suspicious factory worker who was busy preparing something. Suddenly, that factory worker aimed and fired his gun at the president. Fortunately, Eric managed to save the president by jumping in front of him and preventing the bullet from killing him. But as the result, he got shot in the shoulder and suffered from that injury until this day. In the present time, Arrington came to Eric's house and searched for drugs there. She believed that Eric was an addict. Eric admitted that he consumed too much painkillers because he wanted to get rid of the pain of his shoulder injury. At the motel, Diane asked Rose to give the hard drive to her. She tried to convince her that she was on her side and she was going to show those files only to the president. But Rose refused to give the hard drive to her. She said that she and Peter would keep the hard drive and investigate the murder of her aunt and uncle by themselves. Then, she told her that she found an address on the hard drive. She asked her about Osprey. Diane believed that Osprey was a codename and promised that she would look into it. After that, Peter and Rose went to the address that they found on the hard drive. They knocked on the door and a lady called Lorna opened the door. They pretended to be journalists but Lorna didn't believe them. She aimed her shotgun at them and told them that she didn't want to talk to them. But suddenly, Rose told her that she had visited that place with her aunt and uncle when she was a child. She believed that Lorna was the person who treated her wound back then. After Lorna heard that, she finally let Rose and Peter in. Turned out, she was friends with Rose's aunt and uncle and even used to work with them. She was sad and surprised when she heard that Emma and Henry were murdered three days ago. Then, Rose told her about the address that she found in the hard drive that led them to her house. She asked her to help them to investigate this problem since it was an urgent problem that related to the metro bombing and threatened the national security. She also feared that there was the same attack that was going to happen in the near future. Lorna told them that before the Campbells died, they asked her to find the blueprints of some public infrastructures and building schemes. At the university, Maddie and her professor flirted with each other again. Maddie had no idea that her professor was the man who was responsible for the metro bombing. While Rose, Peter, and Lorna were heading to town, Lorna told them that she and Emma were attending the same Russian class together. It also seemed like she knew Peter's father, Pete Sutherland. They finally arrived at a cafe in town. They visited the cafe because they thought that the next attack was going to happen there. Lorna showed the files that she sent to the Campbells to Rose. When Peter went to the restroom, he noticed that there was a shaking of the ground. Turned out, the metro passed directly beneath that cafe. Then, Peter returned to Lorna and Rose's desk. They observed the map of that area together. Rose noticed that the metro was divided by two great gas pipelines. If those gas pipelines exploded, then two city blocks would be destroyed. Lorna asked Peter and Rose to find the original target of the metro bombing. Before Lorna left that place, she told Peter that she knew the two agents who were investigating his father's case. Not long after that, Peter received a call from Cisco. Cisco informed him that the car that he asked him to be investigated had been found in a residential area. Peter asked him not to take any action before he arrived there because it was really dangerous. At another place, Dale received a call from his boss. His boss and the government officer from the White House ordered him to go to the address that they gave him and kill their target there. Peter and Rose finally arrived at the open house where Dale and Ellen stayed. They met the police officers who had been waiting for them there. Dale and the police officers were going to search the house, meanwhile Rose was going to stay in the car. Peter and the police officers finally got into the house and searched that place, but they failed to find Ellen and Dale there. Turned out, those two assassins had already left that place and came to Lorna's house. They were going to kill Lorna there. At another place, Arrington watched the video of the former president of the United States who was visiting Eric at the hospital after he saved him from the attempted murder. After Peter and Rose searched that house, they checked into a hotel to take a rest and think about the next step that they were going to take. They were getting closer to each other as they were telling each other about their personal lives. After Dale and Ellen killed Lorna, they buried her dead body in the woods to destroy the trail of evidence. Ty next morning, Peter told Rose about the characteristic of the perpetrator of the metro bombing. 
He said that he saw a rattlesnake tattoo on that man's body when he had a fight with him after the incident took place. At the university, Eric came to the painting studio of Maddie's professor and checked the place to make sure that the studio was secured. After he left that place, Maddie's professor kissed Maddie right away. Maddie was happy when he did that because she was madly in love with him. She had no idea that her professor was only flirting with her because he wanted to use her. At the hotel, Rose showed Peter a footage from the day when the Metro bombing took place. In that footage, there was a woman who was sitting for five hours at the cafe that Rose and Peter visited with Lorna earlier. That woman was Arrington, the Secret Service agent who was assigned to protect Maddie. Peter noticed that Arrington was talking to someone through a microphone in that footage. Apparently, the government officer from the White House who had ordered assassins to kill the Campbells and Lorna was Maddie's father, the Vice President of the United States. That day, he came to Maddie's dorm room to visit her. Peter believed that this was no longer a terror attack but an attempted murder of a government officer. But he had no idea about who was that government officer who was being targeted. At Maddie's dorm room, Arrington heard Maddie and her father were having an argument. It seemed like Maddie had a bad relationship with her father. At another place, Maddie's professor sent a text to the mysterious man with the rattlesnake tattoo. He said that he was getting closer to the daughter of the Vice President of the United States. For years ago, Arrington graduated from the Secret Service Academy. As the director of the United States Secret Service, Ben Almora was present in that graduation ceremony to give a speech. He advised the graduates to do their job carefully because any mistake that they did as a Secret Service agent could be fatal. Arrington was surprised when she saw her mother attending that graduation ceremony. Her mother didn't agree with her career choice but she still wanted to support her daughter. She took a look at the necklace that she gave to Arrington and said that she was proud of her. In the present time, Arrington was guarding Maddie when she walked her father to his car. Maddie and her father were still having an argument. But when the media took their picture together, Maddie pretended to smile and like her father. After that, Maddie returned to her dorm room. She confided in Arrington that she hated her father for using her as his campaign property. Suddenly, Arrington received a message from her colleague. He informed her that an FBI agent wanted to meet her. Turned out, that FBI agent was Peter. Peter wanted to ask Arrington about the person whom she was guarding on the day when the Metro bombing took place. Arrington refused to answer his question because the protocol demanded him to follow the chain of command. Peter told her that he was investigating a case under the White House Chief of Staff's order. But Arrington insisted on not answering his question until her boss allowed her to do that. Rose told her that she worried if Maddie might be in danger. Arrington assured her that Maddie would be safe under her protection. After that, Rose and Peter went to the library at that university to find a clue about the ring that was worn by the intruder who broke into Peter's apartment. At the White House, Ben received a call from Arrington. Arrington told him that Peter interrogated her about the person whom she was guarding on the day when the Metro bombing happened. After Ben ended his call, he came to Diane's office and confronted her. He was mad at her because she had no right to send her subordinate to interrogate his agent. He said that he didn't like her for doing a secret investigation. Diane and Ben then got into an argument and blamed each other for this case. At the library, Peter was doubtful that the perpetrator of the Metro bombing was PIF. If they were the real perpetrator, the government would have launched a military operation since a few days ago. Rose suggested that they went through Hawkins' computer since Hawkins was the government officer who was responsible for this investigation. But Peter said that it would be better if they talked to Hawkins' widow. Rose agreed with his idea. Peter finally decided to go to Hawkins' house and talk to his widow alone meanwhile Rose was going to stay at that library to do some research about the ring that was worn by the intruder. Before Peter left that library, he suddenly received a call from Arrington. Arrington told him that Maddie was not involved in this problem. Peter said that he saw her staying at a cafe on the day when the Metro bombing took place, but Arrington still said nothing. He then asked if she knew something about the codename Osprey but Arrington said that she didn't know anything about it. At the university, when the class was over, Maddie left a paper for her professor. At the White House, Ben arranged a meeting with the President, the Vice President, the Deputy Director of the FBI, and Diane. He told them that Diane ordered Peter and Rose to visit Maddie's university and interrogate Arrington about the danger that might be faced by Maddie. The Vice President was surprised when he heard that. He asked Diane for an explanation because he was worried with his daughter's safety. Diane told them that she had no idea about what Peter and Rose were investigating. She tried to call Peter but she was unable to contact him. Then, the President asked Diane to talk to her in private. 
Diane finally told her that Peter and Rose were investigating the Campbell's case. The president was surprised when she heard that. She asked Diane to take Peter and Rose to the White House soon because they were investigating a dangerous case. Meanwhile Peter was talking to Hawkins' widow at Hawkins' house. Turned out, that widow was also working as an FBI agent 20 years ago. She told Peter that she had told everything that she knew to the FBI. She thought that the FBI didn't respect her husband who had been working and dedicating himself there for 30 years. Peter understood her pain. He told her that when he was 16 years old, the FBI also accused his father of committing crime and arrested him. Unfortunately, his father died in a car accident before he managed to clear his name. Peter said that he had no idea if Hawkins was murdered because he tried to reveal the truth or because he was responsible for the bombing incident. But he needed to find the answer soon if he didn't want the situation to get worse. At the library, Rose realized that the ring that was worn by the intruder was similar to the Pavelic family coat of arms. She then did some research about the Pavelic family and found an interesting article. That article stated that Pavelic refused to be called as the crown prince of Yugoslavia because he opposed the idea of monarchy. At Hawkins' house, Hawkins' widow finally opened up to Peter after she heard his story. She said that her husband suspected that there was someone who tried to interfere with the investigation that was carried out by the FBI, but that person wasn't Omar Zadar. After her husband investigated it, he found out that the person linked to a government contractor called Turn Lake Industries. He was supposed to meet a CEO of that company on the day he died. At the library, Rose was still doing some research about the ring. She found out that the crown prince had been reported missing. She was surprised when she saw the face of the suspect in his missing case because that man looked like Dale, the assassin who was chasing after her. At Hawkins' house, Hawkins' widow told Peter that her husband was close to the Campbells. Her husband was greatly saddened by the death of his friends. He even cried when he heard that Emma and Henry had been murdered. Because of that, he decided to investigate the murder case of the Campbells. Hawkins' widow hoped that Peter could solve this case to pay for the death of her husband and the Campbells. At another place, Maddie's professor was meeting with a man. He told that man that Maddie would visit him at his house without her bodyguards the next evening. He started to feel nervous because he felt guilty for using and manipulating her. That man calmed him down and said that everything would be fine. At the White House, Ben asked Eric if he was doing well. He was worried about him after he heard Arrington's report. He also asked Eric about his opinion of Arrington. Eric said that he just needed some time to get used to his new job. For Arrington, he thought that she was a smart and professional agent. But he was worried about her close and friendly relationship with Maddie. He thought that it could cause a problem in the future. At Maddie's dorm room, Arrington helped Maddie to choose a dress that she was going to wear at the gallery opening. After Maddie wore that dress, Arrington lent her the necklace that her mother gave her so she could look more beautiful. Peter finally got back to the library and shared the information that he got from Hawkins' widow with Rose. He told her about the government contractor called Turn Lake Industries. Rose was surprised when she heard that. She told him about what she found out about the ring. She said that the crown prince disappeared after he criticized an American defense contractor for conducting shadow military operation in the Balkans. Turned out, that contractor was Turn Lake Industries. Then, Peter called Diane. He asked her about Turn Lake Industries. He believed that this company had something to do with the murder of the Campbells. Diane said that she didn't know a lot about that company. She asked Peter and Rose to go to the White House soon because the president wanted to talk to them. After Peter ended his call, Rose told him that they needed to look into the financial report of Turn Lake Industries to find the government officers who were connected to that company. They finally found out that Turn Lake Industries had transferred a lot of money to the vice president of the United States called Ashley Redfield. They also found out that the CEO of that government contractor was Gordon Wick. Before Maddie went to the gallery opening, Arrington told Eric to leave because she would guard Maddie by herself. After that, she came to that place with Maddie. At the gallery opening, Maddie told Arrington that she needed to use the restroom. Arrington checked the restroom first before she allowed Maddie to go there. Outside the library, Dale and Ellen were waiting for Peter and Rose. They finally saw Peter and Rose coming out of the library and heading to the car. They followed them immediately once they left. At the gallery opening, Arrington was waiting for Maddie outside the restroom. She finally decided to check the restroom because Maddie hadn't come back yet. She panicked when she found an apology note on the mirror. There was also Maddie's phone on the basin. Turned out, Maddie had escaped through the window. Arrington called for backup immediately. 
Eric and other Secret Service agents rushed to that place after they heard that the daughter of the Vice President of the United States was missing. Apparently, Maddie went to her professor's house. She managed to go there without being followed by her bodyguards. Meanwhile, all agents of the Secret Service were busy looking for Maddie. Eric told Arrington that he suspected Maddie's professor because he once saw him being too friendly with Maddie. Arrington then decided to go to Maddie's professor's house. She asked Eric to find the address meanwhile she was going to drive the car. At Maddie's professor's house, Maddie and her professor were making love. But suddenly, the man with the rattlesnake tattoo came to that room and killed Maddie's professor with his gun. After that, he dragged Maddie out of the house. Arrington and Eric finally arrived at Maddie's professor's house. They searched the place but they couldn't find Maddie anywhere. They were surprised when they found the dead body of Maddie's professor lying on the ground. Two years ago, after Ellen and Dale killed the crown prince of Yugoslavia, they disposed of the body in the lake. Ellen took the crown prince's ring and put it on Dale's finger. Dale had been wearing that ring since then. In the present time, Rose and Peter were on their way to the White House. Suddenly, Peter noticed that a car was following them. He drove his car faster to escape from that car. Elle and Dale pulled out for a while after they realized that Peter knew that they were following them. They didn't have to worry that they would lose them because they had put a car GPS tracker on Peter's car. At another place, Ben told the vice president that Maddie had been kidnapped by a stranger. The vice president was surprised when he heard that. Peter and Rose decided to change their plan. Instead of taking Rose to the White House, Peter took Rose to Cisco's apartment. Before he left, Peter asked Rose to come to their meeting place if something bad happened to her. That meeting place was a park called Foundry Branch, the place where Peter and his father used to go fishing together. Meanwhile Eric and Arrington were still searching Maddie's professor's house. They found many sketches of the man with the rattlesnake tattoo there. Suddenly, Ben came to that place. He told Arrington to leave and ordered Eric to take over the investigation. He blamed Arrington for losing Maddie and failing to protect her. But Eric insisted on Arrington staying to help with the investigation because Arrington knew Maddie more than everyone else in that room. At Cisco's apartment, Rose and Cisco had dinner together. They were talking about Peter. Meanwhile outside, Ellen and Dale were watching that apartment and waiting for their target to come out. At Maddie's professor's house, Arrington was mad at Eric because he told Ben about her method to protect Maddie. But she knew that it was the least thing that she should worry right now. Eric told her that they should be partners and focus on finding Maddie. Suddenly, Arrington remembered that Maddie kept a secret box in her room. She opened that box and found a leaflet of an international environmental organization called New Leaf in it. Eric found out that the leader of that organization was called Paolo. He was the man in Maddie's professor's sketches, the man with the rattlesnake tattoo. At the White House, Peter met with Diane in her office. Diane was disappointed because Peter didn't bring Rose with him. She then told him that her secretary had investigated about Turn Lake Industries. She found out that the CEO of that company, Gordon Wick, used to be a personnel of the United States Navy before he became a businessman. Peter told her about his theory that Turn Lake Industries was responsible for the Metro bombing but they tried to blame it on Omar Zadar and PIF. He made that assumption after Hawkins' widow told him that Hawkins was supposed to meet the CEO of Turn Lake Industries on the night he died. He believed that the Metro bombing was not a terror attack but an attempted murder of an important person whom Arrington protected that day. He also believed that there was a government officer from the White House who informed Gordon Wick about the night action. Peter suspected that the vice president was the one who was working with Gordon to kill Hawkins and the Campbells. Diane was surprised when she saw a picture of Gordon and the vice president together. She said that she would arrange a meeting with the president and asked Peter to bring Rose and his cop friend to that meeting. Suddenly, Peter realized about something. He called Rose immediately and told her to get out of that apartment with Cisco right now. He realized that Diane was involved in this too since he had never told her that his friend was a police officer. Turned out, Peter was true. In her office, Diane called Gordon Wick and told him that Peter and Rose knew. She suggested that they had Peter arrested and Rose killed. Outside Cisco's apartment, Ellen and Dale saw Cisco and Rose leaving with their car. They chased them immediately. At the White House, Diane and Nathan decided to arrest Peter, but they couldn't find Peter anywhere. Turned out, Peter was trying to escape from the White House. While he was looking for the exit, he met his colleague called Liam there. He stole Liam's access card and used it to run away from that place. Some agents saw him and chased him immediately. Peter ran as fast as he could and hid in an engine room. 
While he was hiding, he saw an agent inserting a code to use the special elevator. At another place, Ellen and Dale were chasing Cisco and Rose. But suddenly, a bus passed in front of their car. Cisco and Rose who noticed that they were being chased by them used that moment to run away from them. After the agents who were chasing him were gone, Peter came out of his hiding place and used the same special elevator. At some corner street, Cisco realized that there was a car GPS tracker on that car. Because of that, he decided to drop off Rose there and asked her to go to her meeting place with Peter. Meanwhile, he was going to distract the attention of Ellen and Dale. Dale saw Rose getting out of the car. He got out of his car too and followed her immediately. Meanwhile, Ellen was going to stay in the car and chase Cisco. She finally managed to crash into his car and shot Cisco in the head. Cisco died instantly because of that. At the foundry branch, Rose was surprised when she saw Dale in that place. She tried to run away from him but he managed to catch and attack her. When Dale was about to kill Rose, Peter suddenly came to that place and attacked Dale. He told Rose to run away immediately. Then, Peter and Dale got into a fight. Peter was struggling to fight Dale and even almost got killed by him. But Rose helped her by hitting Dale with a log. They finally managed to have the upper hand and kill Dale. At the White House, Diane told the Vice President that Peter and Rose had found out about the plan they made with Gordon Wick. The Vice President was surprised when he heard that. Diane suggested that they used Maddie's kidnapping to get public sympathy before Peter managed to jeopardize their career. Ellen came to the Foundry Branch to look for Dale. She was shocked when she saw Dale's dead body floating in the lake. Meanwhile Peter and Rose went to a boat and hid there. The boat belonged to Peter's father's best friend who was also his godfather. At another place, Eric received a picture from Ben. It was the picture of the suspect of Maddie's kidnapping. Arrington was surprised when she saw that picture. At the boat, Peter and Rose were listening to live press conference on the radio. In that press conference, the vice president told the public about his sad story. He said that he had been living in pain since his wife died of cancer and his youngest daughter died in accident when she was only three years old. The only family member whom he had right now was only Maddie, but he had no idea about where she was right now. He was afraid if he would lose her too like he lost his wife and youngest daughter. He asked people out there to help her to find his daughter. Then, he said that the name of the suspect of Maddie's kidnapping was Peter Sutherland. Rose and Peter were surprised when they heard that. Fourteen years ago, after his wife died of cancer, Ashley Redfield had to live alone with his daughters, Maddie and Sarah. One day, while his daughters were playing together near the pool, he neglected them by busy talking to someone on the phone. When he returned to the backyard to check on them, he was surprised to see Sarah was drowning in the pool. Instead of admitting his mistake for neglecting them, Redfield blamed Maddie for Sarah's death. He said that Sarah drowned because Maddie didn't look after her. In the present time, Maddie was being held in a room by a man with the rattlesnake tattoo. That man still refused to tell her why he kidnapped her. Meanwhile Rose and Peter were still hiding in the boat. Peter felt guilty because his best friend died when he helped him with this investigation. Rose told him that it was not his fault. She encouraged him to fight and continue this investigation until they found the truth. After that, they made out and had sex. Eric and Arrington came to Peter's house and searched that place. They found a card that was sent by a man called Jim there. Eric believed that there was something off about Peter being a suspect of Maddie's kidnapping. Arrington agreed with him. They thought that the White House accused Peter of kidnapping Maddie because they wanted to hide something from the public. Because of that, they decided to investigate this case on their own. They used the leaflet that they found in Maddie's dorm room to find out about what actually happened. At the White House, Diane told the president that she believed that Peter kidnapped Maddie because he wanted to use her as leverage to find out about what happened to his father. The president asked her if she made a mistake when she hired Peter. Diane admitted that she made a mistake but she promised that she would fix it. The president became suspicious of her and told her to take a step back from this case. Eric and Arrington visited New Leaf's office. They met a worker there and asked him about Maddie's professor. That man told them that Maddie's professor was called Paolo Bonetto, the founder of New Leaf. He said that Paolo planned to bring Maddie into their organization. Then, Eric asked him about the man with the rattlesnake tattoo. That man told them that it was Paolo's boyfriend, Matteo. But he said that Matteo hadn't been showing up for weeks. In the boat, Peter told Rose that the FBI counterintelligence division accused his father of leaking classified documents that could threaten national security. 
Rose suggested that they use Liam's access card that was stolen by Peter to look into the case files for the Metro bombing in the FBI system. She used her skills as an IT engineer to hack Liam's access card. At another place, Gordon, the vice president, and Diane met. Gordon showed the vice president a recent video of Maddie that he had received from Matteo. In that video, Matteo also demanded the vice president to confess that he was responsible for the Metro bombing within two days. Matteo threatened that if the vice president didn't do it, then he would force Maddie to tell the world about the truth and kill her after that. The vice president wanted to do it because he was worried about his daughter, but Diane said that they couldn't do that. She told him to cut his grieving father act because she knew that Maddie hated him and planned to destroy him. The vice president didn't understand about what she was talking about. Diane then gave him the doll with the hidden camera that Ellen and Dale took from Maddie's therapist. Turned out, there was a footage of Maddie's confrontation with her father about what happened to Sarah inside of that doll. Maddie planned to use that evidence to destroy her father. At another place, Maddie was calling out for help but nobody heard her. She finally smashed the wall and found something inside of that wall. But suddenly, Matteo came to that room. Maddie covered the hole in the wall with her leg immediately. Then, she told Matteo that she could help him to destroy her father if he wanted to take revenge. She told him about the footage of her confrontation with her father and the address of her therapist's house where she kept the footage. In the boat, Peter and Rose looked into the suspect lists and found one name that could be a clue. That name was Colin Worley, an employee at Turn Lake Industries who died a day before the FBI managed to interrogate him. Since he died under strange circumstances, Peter and Rose planned to go to the public record office and find his autopsy reports to find out more about what happened. At the White House, Eric and Arrington reported to Diane and Ben. They told them that they doubted that Peter was the person responsible for Maddie's kidnapping. They suspected that the kidnapper was a man called Matteo, but Diane insisted that Peter was the prime suspect of this case and urged them to arrest him soon. After that, Diane called Gordon and told him about Matteo. She said that Matteo was affiliated with an environmental organization called New Leaf. She sent a sketch of Matteo's face to Gordon and Gordon recognized him right away. At another place, Matteo returned to Maddie's room after he checked the address that Maddie gave him. He said that he didn't find the footage that Maddie told him there. He only found a police record that stated that the woman in that house was killed last week. Maddie told him that she put that doll in the basement and it was only her therapist who knew about it. Meanwhile the vice president was watching the footage of Maddie's confrontation with him. In that video, Maddie who was tired of being blamed by her father for the death of her sister said that it was her father's fault that her sister died. Back then, while Maddie and Sarah were playing together near the pool, Redfield opened the pool fence and then left them alone to talk to someone on the phone. Redfield was angry when he heard that. He attacked her and called her liar. Ellen visited Gordon at his house. She threatened him with a knife and asked him about Peter's hiding place. She wanted to take revenge on Peter for the death of her boyfriend. Dale promised that he would help her to find Peter, but he asked her to kill Maddie first. He said that Maddie could be a problem to them since she knew too much. Peter and Rose finally visited the public record office. Rose went inside of the building to find the documents about Colin Worley meanwhile Peter waited in the car. While Peter was waiting for her in the car, a group of people saw him and recognized him. Inside of the building, Rose got a problem because she couldn't show her identity card to a woman there. She tried to persuade her but that woman refused to help her because she was afraid of getting fired. Rose finally left that place but that woman suddenly called her. She decided to give the documents to Rose secretly. She said that she couldn't give those documents to her earlier since there was a CCTV camera in the entrance hall. Rose thanked her and left that building. Outside of that building, she was confused because she couldn't find Peter there. Suddenly, she was approached by a group of people who saw and recognized Peter earlier. She tried to run away from them but they kept following and harassing her. Fortunately, Peter arrived just in time in that place and rescued her. Eric and Arrington visited Jim at his house and asked him about Peter. Jim was Peter's godfather and a journalist at the Baltimore Sun Jim told him that Peter's father was his best friend. He also treated and thought of Peter as his own son. But he had never heard from Peter anymore after he published an article about Peter's father being a traitor. So, he didn't know where Peter was right now. But he believed that Peter wasn't the one who kidnapped the daughter of the vice president. Suddenly, Eric and Arrington saw a picture of Jim and Peter on the boat. They asked him about the address of that boat. In the boat, Peter and Rose looked into the documents that they got from the public record office. 
They found out that Colin Morley had a keycard for a P.O. box from a subsidiary of Turn Lake Industries called Allentine Manufacturing. They also found the pictures of Colin Morley there, which included the picture of his body that had rattlesnake tattoo. Peter realized that Colin Morley was the perpetrator of the Metro bombing. He believed that Turn Lake Industries hired him to bomb the train and then killed him to cover their tracks. After that, Peter and Rose decided to go to the P.O. box to find out more about this case. But while they were heading to the car, Eric and Arrington suddenly came to that place and arrested them. One year ago, after the bombing incident took place, Peter was trying to catch Colin, the man who had put the bomb inside of the train. Colin managed to run away from him and returned home safely. Apparently, Colin was Mateo's twin brother and Gordon was the one who hired him to bomb the train under the order of the vice president. When Colin arrived at home, he was shocked when he saw his twin brother already lying dead on the floor. Mateo was murdered but his murderer tried to make it look like he died from drug overdose. Colin believed that the murderer was hired by the people who hired him to bomb the train. When the murderer came to that place, he mistook Mateo as Colin and then murder him to destroy the evidence. So, to hide his identity, Colin stole Mateo's identity card and had been pretending as Mateo since then. In the present time, Peter and Rose told Eric and Arrington that they had been accused by the White House. They said that Diane and the vice president planned the Metro bombing and hired a man called Colin Morley to bomb the train. They asked them to check the documents of Colin Morley there. Eric and Arrington checked those documents right away. They were surprised when they saw the picture of Colin because it was the same man whom they believed was Maddie's kidnapper. Suddenly, the police officers whom Arrington called earlier arrived at that place. Arrington told them that they were all right and didn't need them anymore. After that, Eric, Arrington, Peter, and Rose went inside of that boat and had a conversation. Peter said that he believed that the real target of that metro bombing was the person whom Arrington protected on the day when the bombing incident took place. Turned out, Colin had been in the suspect list of the FBI even before the statement from PIF got leaked. Rose said that she took documents about Colin from the public record office because she sensed something wrong about his death. Arrington agreed with her. She found it strange that Colin became the suspect of Maddie's kidnapping when he was already dead. After Eric checked his birth certificate, he found out that Colin had a twin brother called Mateo. Peter believed that Turn Lake Industries killed Mateo because they mistook him as Colin. He suggested them to find Colin soon so they could ask him about the truth. At another place, Colin forced Maddie to urge her father to confess that he planned the Metro bombing and covered it up. While Maddie was doing that, Colin took her video. After that, he sent that video to Gordon and warned him that there were only two hours left for the vice president to do what Maddie asked him in the video. Even though Maddie said that she supported Colin to destroy her father, he still doubted that she was on his side. After Gordon and Diane received and watched Maddie's video, they agreed to keep it from the vice president. They were afraid if the vice president agreed to do what Colin asked him. If Redfield confessed everything to the public, then their career would be in danger too. After that, Diane and Gordon met Redfield in his office. Redfield began to suspect them after Gordon told him that the perpetrator of Maddie's kidnapping was only one person. He found it strange that Gordon knew about it. He also found it strange that Maddie's video was only sent to Gordon and not to him directly. Gordon finally told him that Maddie's kidnapper was the person who put the bomb in the train. That person was called Colin. Gordon admitted that his team made a mistake by killing Colin's twin brother after Colin finished doing his job. Then, he reminded Redfield that they were doing this for this country. So, even though Maddie's life was in danger, Redfield couldn't do what Colin asked him to do. Diane and Gordon even said that they were going to kill Maddie if the situation got worse. Eric, Arrington, Peter, and Rose visited the P.O. box where Colin kept his belongings. They found many documents there, including documents about Maddie's professor, Maddie's colleagues and friends, and Maddie's course schedule. At another place, while Colin was gone, Maddie expanded the hole in the wall and saw a number code inside of that wall. She suspected that it was a train number. Suddenly, Colin returned to that room. He said that he still didn't receive any answer from her father. Maddie suggested that they took another video and sent it to her father's phone number. At her office, Arrington finally told Peter that the person whom she was guarding on the day when the Metro bombing took place was Omar Zadar, the leader of PIF. His codename was Osprey. Peter was surprised when he heard that. Instead of being the culprit of this incident, he was being a target of the attempted murder. The vice president and his group couldn't kill Omar Zadar directly because half-citizens of the United States would take to the streets to demonstrate against his murder if they did that. 
So, they needed to make his death look like an accident. They planned the metro bombing and hoped that Omar was destroyed with two city blocks and other passengers of the train. Suddenly, Arrington received a recent video of Maddie that begged her father to confess about what he did. While she was watching that video with Peter, she noticed that Maddie tried to communicate with her audience in Morse code. After she and Peter translated that code, they found out that Maddie was being held in a train number R142. Arrington tried to report it to the White House but Peter stopped her immediately. He said that they couldn't trust anyone at the White House. He suggested that they kept this information to themselves until they managed to find Maddie. Arrington finally agreed with him. At another place, Maddie tried to grab the light pole in front of her with her leg. She planned to do something with that light pole. At the White House, Diane was disappointed because the president didn't allow her to attend the special meeting on Omar Zahar's plan to make concession. In that meeting, the president said that she wanted to give a chance to the executives of PIF to work together with them, but the vice president rejected her idea immediately. Redfield thought that PIF was a dangerous terrorist group, but the president defended them by saying that Omar Zadar was a professional politician who was loved by many citizens of the United States. The president believed that it was better for them to become PIF's political ally than their opponent. Apparently, the reason why the vice president tried to kill Omar Zadar was because he was afraid if he lost to him in the next election. At Arrington's office, when Peter was looking for information about the train number R142 on internet, he found out that R142 was not a train number, but a container number. Suddenly, Arrington received a call from Eric. Eric told her that Colin had been working as a security guard at a container shipping company for these past six months. After Arrington heard that, she realized that Maddie was being held by Colin at a container port. Apparently, Ellen had been watching Eric and Rose from afar. When Eric and Rose were heading to their meeting place with Arrington and Peter, Ellen followed them immediately. Peter and Arrington finally arrived at the container port. But unfortunately, they were caught by Colin on CCTV camera. Colin panicked when he saw them there. He ran to Maddie's container right away and planned to take her from that place. Since there were many containers in that area, Arrington and Peter decided to go to different ways and search those containers. Not long after that, Eric and Rose also arrived at that place. Eric told Rose to stay in the car because it might be dangerous for her. While Colin was entering Maddie's container, Maddie suddenly attacked him and stabbed him with the light pole. After that, she ran away from that container. Colin tried to stop her by firing his gun at her for several times. Once Arrington and Peter heard those gunshots, they rushed to the location of the gunfire. At the same time, Maddie was running as fast as she could because Colin began to chase her. She finally bumped into Peter and Arrington. Arrington rescued her immediately meanwhile Peter was fighting with Colin. Turned out, Ellen had arrived at that place. She was ready to kill her targets with her sniper rifle. While Eric and Arrington were about to take Maddie from that place, Eric noticed that there was a shooter. Ellen fired her rifle and killed Colin instantly with it. Peter, Arrington, Eric, and Maddie were hiding from her behind the container, but Ellen still managed to shoot Maddie in the leg. Maddie screamed in pain when that happened. While Peter and the others were trying to escape from that place, Eric suddenly got shot in the chest. The bullet from Ellen's shooting managed to penetrate his bulletproof vest. Then, Ellen planned to kill Peter next, but Rose suddenly came to the tower and pushed her to the ground. Ellen died instantly because of that. One year ago, right after the metro bombing took place, Diane was heading to the White House. Suddenly, the vice president called her and asked her to meet him at his house. When Diane arrived there, the vice president introduced her to Gordon. He told her that he was the one who planned the metro bombing because he wanted to kill a foreign politician on U.S. soil. Diane was shocked when she heard that. Redfield justified his action by saying that Omar Zadar was a terrorist. He said that he was afraid if Omar Zadar and PIF would influence the president and put this country in danger. Then, Redfield asked Diane to protect them. He asked her to do this for the president and the United States. He said that if they were caught and ended up being charged, then the president and the whole country would be in danger too. He knew that Diane was very loyal to the president. So, he wanted to use her loyalty to make sure that she protected them. In the present time, while Rose was checking Ellen's body, Ellen's phone suddenly rang. Turned out, it was a call from Gordon. Rose answered the call and pretended to be Ellen. Gordon told her to return to their base camp if she had finished doing her job. Rose pretended that she forgot the address and asked him to send the address. Gordon was surprised when he heard that. He ended his call immediately after he realized that he was not talking to Ellen. 
Meanwhile, Arrington was heartbroken at Eric's death. She couldn't believe that she had to lose Eric when they were just getting to know each other better. At the same time, Maddie asked Peter if it was true that her father planned the Metro bombing and Peter said yes. He also added that her father did that because he wanted to kill Omar Zadar. Then, Peter and Rose left that place because the police were on their way. They also needed to solve this case before the second attack happened. At the base camp, Gordon was wondering about who might have answered his call on Ellen's phone. Suddenly, Diane came to that place. She told them about what happened at the container port. Redfield was getting more frustrated when he heard that. He was only relieved when he found out that his daughter managed to be saved. Then, Gordon told them that they were ready for the second attack on Omar Zadar. He said that the airplane that was carrying Omar was going to land at Joint Base Andrews at 4 a.m. tomorrow. They planned to bomb him when he was picked up from the airport. After that, they decided to divide tasks. The vice president was going to handle Maddie and meanwhile Diane was going to interrogate Arrington. They wanted to find out about how much Maddie and Arrington knew about this problem. Peter and Rose visited Jim at his house. They wanted to ask him for help. Peter told everything that he knew about Metro bombing to Jim. He asked Jim to publish an article about it so the public would know about the truth. Jim was willing to help Peter, but he said that he needed strong evidence. He didn't want the public to think that he wrote fake news. Then, Peter mentioned about the article that Jim wrote about his father. He was mad because Jim believed that his father was innocent but at the same time called him a traitor in his article. He and Jim got into an argument because of that. Suddenly, Rose interrupted their argument. She showed them some documents that she found in Ellen's phone. Those documents were related to the night action as they contained codenames and files about many night action agents like the Campbells. Peter was surprised when he saw. He said that those files could only be accessed by high-ranking government officers like Diane and Hawkins. He believed that Diane was the one who leaked those documents. If he was true, then he could take Diane to the court. The problem was, Diane might have deleted her trail even though only Ben who could request access to the login details. They decided to find someone who could help them to access the login details. Before they left, Jim made sure that they got the evidence that he needed to publish the article. At the vice president's house, Arrington and Maddie found out that Omar was going to be targeted the next day. So, they planned to warn the Secret Service agents who were guarding Omar once Omar arrived at the Joint Base Andrews the next day. But since Arrington's badge and phone were taken by her boss, Arrington needed a new phone to warn the Secret Service agents. Maddie told her that she had an old phone that she kept at the basement. Suddenly, the vice president came to that room. He said that he wanted to talk to Maddie. The truth was, he wanted to find out about how much his daughter knew about this case. Arrington went downstairs and had a meeting with Diane, the deputy director of the FBI, and Nathan Briggs. She reported to them about what happened at the container port. Diane asked her if Peter helped her to rescue Maddie at the container port and Arrington denied that she saw him there. Arrington knew that Diane was working with the vice president and Gordon to kill Omar so she decided to hide the truth from her. At another place, Peter and Rose visited Diane's assistant, Valerie, at her apartment. They forced her to write an email request to access the login details. After Peter tied her up, Rose checked her laptop and found an email that Valerie wrote about Omar's Zadar briefing. From that email, they found out that Diane had been barred entry from the briefing without any reason. In Ben's room, Arrington asked Nathan to give her badge and phone back to her. While Nathan was gone from that room, Arrington logged into his computer and found Ben's activity schedule at Camp David. Turned out, Ben was assigned to protect the president at that place. Not long after that, Nathan returned to that room. He told Arrington that he couldn't give her badge and phone back before Ben allowed him to do it. At Maddie's room, the vice president said goodnight to his daughter. As soon as he left that room, Maddie removed her four-line. Turned out, she was just pretending to sleep while her father was there. In another room, the vice president had a conversation with Diane. They didn't trust Maddie and Arrington and believed that they knew more about this case than what they told them. Diane worried if Maddie and Arrington were going to tell everything to the president when they met her at Camp David the next day. After Diane left his house, Redfield called Gordon and told him about an update of this case. He said that if the situation got worse, the worst case scenario was he could issue a pardon by tomorrow night. Turned out, Maddie was listening to his conversation with Gordon secretly from another room. She was confused about what her father meant by that. When Redfield was about to go to another room, he noticed that there were bloodstains on the stairs. He realized that Maddie had left her room and might have overheard his conversation with Gordon. 
So, he went to Manny's room to check on her. After he left that room, Manny gave her old phone that she took from the basement to Arrington. At Valerie's apartment, Rose finally managed to access the login details. She found out that it was Diane who leaked the information about the night action agents to Ellen. Peter asked her to send that evidence to Jim right away. Then, he received a call from Arrington. Arrington told him that the president was going to meet with Omar Zadar at Camp David the next day. She was afraid if it was not only Omar Zadar who was going to be killed in the next attack, but also the president. It was because Maddie overheard that her father was going to issue a pardon and the only person who could issue a pardon was the president. If the president died in that attack, then the vice president would automatically assume the office. Suddenly, the vice president came to Maddie's room. He told Maddie and Arrington that the president asked them to meet her at Camp David the next day. At 4 o'clock in the next morning, the private jet that was carrying Omar Zadar finally arrived at Joint Base Andrews. A Secret Service agent was sent to greet him and escort him to Camp David. They got in the car but suddenly the Secret Service agent had a little difficulty to start the car. But fortunately, she finally managed to start the car and took Omar Zadar away from that place. At the White House, Diane was waiting for a report about the attack on Omar Zadar but she didn't hear anything about it. The next morning, the Vice President, Manny, and Arrington used a presidential helicopter to go to Camp David. In that helicopter, they saw two Secret Service agents entering the helicopter and bringing a mysterious suitcase with them. It seemed like that suitcase contained something important. Arrington whispered to Manny that she had never seen those agents before. As the situation was getting worse, Diane returned to her house and packed her things quickly. She prepared herself to run away from the country. But suddenly, Peter and Rose came to that place and stopped her. Diane was surprised when she saw them there. Peter and Rose confronted her about her contribution in the Metro bombing, the murder of the Campbells, and the next attack on Omar Zadar and the President. Diane was shocked when she heard that the President was also targeted in the next attack. The Vice President and Gordon had never told her about it before. They only told her that they were going to kill Omar Zadar. Diane tried to call the President to warn her about the next attack but she was unreachable. Because they didn't have much time to stop the attack, Diane finally agreed to help Peter to get to Camp David. Eleven years ago, Peter's father, Pete Sutherland, was arrested by the FBI at his house. Peter was confused when he saw that. He had no idea why the FBI arrested his father. In the present time, Diane, Peter, and Rose were on their way to Camp David. Diane told them that she decided to play a role in this crime because she wanted to protect the President and the United States. She said that this whole problem wouldn't have happened if the President didn't create the night action. Rose knew that Diane was only trying to justify her actions. She said that it was not the President or the country that Diane intended to protect, but it was herself. She could never forgive her for ordering assassins to murder her aunt and uncle. Peter also realized that he was only hired by Diane because Diane needed someone to blame if her plan failed. Diane admitted that it was true. Not long after that, they finally arrived at Camp David. But since Peter and Rose were not registered in this meeting, Diane told them to hide in the car trunk. Meanwhile Redfield, Matty, Arrington, and other Secret Service agents had also arrived at Camp David. As soon as they went inside of the building, Redfield and a Secret Service agent took Maddie to a safe room while Arrington remained behind. She was being watched by a new Secret Service agent called Walter. Outside of the building, Diane was stopped at the checkpoint because her name was not registered in the meeting. But after she urged the army guard there to allow her in, she finally managed to pass through the inspection. Maddie thought that her father was going to take her to meet the president. But turned out, her father took her to an underground safe room that could protect her from the bombing instead. Redfield finally admitted that he was going to murder Omar Zadar and the president. He also tried to explain to Maddie why he planned to do that. Maddie cried when she heard that. She couldn't believe that her father could be that evil and cruel. Ben was surprised when he saw Diane at that place. He asked her how she could pass through the checkpoint and Diane said that there was no time for her to explain. She told him that they faced an emergency and they needed to evacuate the president from that place soon. While Diane was busy talking to Ben, Peter and Rose got out of the car quietly. Diane and Ben went inside of the building and continued their conversation. But suddenly, Nathan came to that room and opened fire on them. Diane got badly injured meanwhile Ben died instantly. Peter and Rose rushed to that room after they heard the gunshots. But unfortunately, Nathan had escaped from that place when they arrived there. They saw Diane lying on the floor and suffering from her gunshot wound. 
Diane told them to go to the server room to fix the communication that was down because of the cyber attack. She said that the vice president and his team had set the timer on the bomb. In another room, Arrington knew that she couldn't waste her time anymore after she realized that Walter had just set the bomb timer. So, she attacked and defeated Walter immediately. When Peter and Rose arrived at the communication building, they found one of the vice president's men guarding that place. Peter told Rose to fix the communication meanwhile he was going to fight and defeat that man. At another place, Gordon received a call from Nathan. Nathan reported to him about what happened at Camp David. Gordon panicked when he heard that. He planned to run away from the country with his private jet. After Peter defeated the man at the communication building, he planned to stop the bombing attack by himself. There were only a few minutes left before the bombing attack happened. He told Rose to stay in that building and keep fixing the communication. In another room, Arrington opened the mysterious suitcase that was carried by two suspicious Secret Service agents earlier. She was shocked when she found out that there was a bomb with great explosive power inside of that suitcase. That bomb was going to explode in less than 10 minutes. Because of that, she rushed herself to warn everyone in that building to leave that place soon. In the safe room, Maddie tried to convince her father to cancel everything that he was doing but her father insisted on carrying out his plan. Because of that, she asked him to let her leave that room. She also threatened to tell everything to the world after the bombing incident happened. Instead of changing his mind, Redfield decided to grant his daughter's wish. He told the Secret Service agent to kick Maddie out of that safe room. He didn't care if his daughter died in that blast. In fact, it was better for him if she died because nobody would tell the world about the truth. He could also use her death to gain public sympathy. Meanwhile at another place, Peter and Nathan got into a fight. Peter forced Nathan to stop the attack soon. Even though Nathan was being beaten up badly by him, he still refused to call off the attack. As soon as the communication went back to normal, Arrington informed her colleague that a bomb was going to explode in that place soon. The Secret Service agents were shocked when they received that information. They took the president from that building and escorted her to the car immediately. At the same time, Arrington heard Maddie screaming for help. She went back into the building and found her there. She took her from that building right away and managed to save her right before the bomb exploded. At another place, the army officers came to the place where Peter and Nathan got into a fight. They began to shoot Peter because they thought that Peter was an intruder. But when the bomb exploded, Peter used that moment to run away from them. After the vice president heard the explosion, he thought that he had successfully accomplished his mission. He believed he had become the president of the United States now. Meanwhile the president was being taken by the Secret Service agents to the helicopter. But when she was about to get in the helicopter, Peter suddenly came to that place and shot one of the Secret Service agents who were guarding her. Peter took the president hostage and told the Secret Service agents to switch the helicopter engine off. He also told them to check the helicopter cabin because he believed that there was a bomb there. Turned out, a sniper was ready to kill Peter with his sniper rifle. Other officers in that area also threatened to shoot Peter if he didn't let go of the president. But when the sniper was about to shoot him, the helicopter suddenly exploded. It almost killed the president who was standing too close to the helicopter but fortunately she managed to be saved. After that explosion, the officers arrested Peter immediately. Rose tried to stop them but they ignored her. At Camp David, the vice president was shocked when he found out that Arrington and Maddie survived that bombing attack. He was worried if he was going to receive serious punishment for the crimes that he had committed. In another room, Rose visited Diane and helped her to treat her gunshot wound. She said that she did that because she wanted to see Diane to receive the punishment that she deserved. She made sure that Diane was going to pay for the death of her uncle and aunt. A few weeks after that bombing incident took place, the president asked Peter and Rose to meet her in her office. The president offered to publicly acknowledge Peter's bravery but Peter refused her offer right away. The president then asked him about what he wanted and Peter said that he just wanted to know about what happened to his father. The president agreed and ordered her subordinate to get Peter's father's file. On the other hand, Arrington was happy because she got promoted to become the bodyguard of the president. After that, she met Maddie at a restaurant. Turned out, Maddie was going to testify against her father. She also planned to study abroad after this case was done. At the White House, Peter checked his father's file and found a video there. In that video, Peter's father admitted that he had leaked private information about Pentagon after he was offered a sum of money by a private contractor. Peter was sad and disappointed when he found out about that. After he finished watching that video, 
he thanked the president for allowing him to access that file. Suddenly, the president told him that his father was innocent and that video was taken when he prepared himself to go undercover. The truth was, Peter's father didn't die in a car accident. He was killed by an assassin who was hired by the private contractor before he even started working undercover. His assassin was later tracked and killed by Delta Force operators. Until this day, the White House decided to keep this information from public. Then, the president offered Peter to become a night agent who called instead of receiving call. In other words, a night agent who worked in the field like the Campbells. The president thought that Peter might like this job because the night action agents operated in all countries around the world. Before Peter left the United States to do his first mission in another country, he said goodbye to Rose and asked her to wait for him.